that will that never, never work. work. You can't, you can't publish, publish that. that. Seriously? No, 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 Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. Welcome to Horrible Writing. I'm your host, Paul Sading. With me this time, I have a wonderful author who... I am really looking forward to talking to about this topic because this is a very, very, very important topic, not only to me, but socially and on a humanistic level. Who I have with me is Gwen Katz. Gwen is a young adult author, but also has some work coming out. Maybe we'll get to it in the uh, in the interview about nonfiction uh, an, in a nonfiction anthology where we talk about some science and how it can kind of help us writers who want to get science involved in our stories, actually do it a little bit better. So Gwen, welcome to Horrible Writing. Hi, thanks for having me. I am really interested in uh, talking to you about the topic. And obviously anybody who's listening to the show now has already seen the title of the episode. And it came about under, our our introduction to each other came about as uh, under controversial circumstances and and situation. And you were very kind about raising the platform, raising the voice and getting attention on the issue. And I asked if you would be willing to do the show and you were more than willing to do it. So I'm very honored to have you here and to talk about uh, the nature, if you will, for lack of a better term, the nature of being an LGBTQ plus author and the industry itself when it comes to dealing with LGBTQ writers, their fiction, their stories, and, you know, the ugly, ugly, ugliness of homophobia. So before we get into the controversy that kind of brought us together, I'd love to hear a little bit about your story. Who is Gwen Katz? Um, I'm an author and I live in uh, Pasadena and I am mainly known for uh, wearing pilotkas and having a constant revolving door of homeless animals in my house. <laughs> Is there a particular kind of animal? <laughs> uh, a lot of cats, but we also have chickens right now. Oh, really? That's an interest, mm. interesting uh, dynamic there, I imagine. Uh, they don't interact with each other. <laughs> Probably for the best. Probably yes. for the best. So the cats would love to meet the chickens. Oh, the I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure um, they would. <laughs> the feeling is not mutual. <laughs> I am sure they would. So a few months ago now, it's taken us a while because of my interview schedule. Uh, I had to kind of put this off for a while, and I appreciated your patience on this. And and it might provide a little bit more clarity uh, to now that we're a little removed from the inciting incident, if you will. But a few months mm-hmm. ago. Uh, I came across you because somehow you came across a call to action that was out there in the writing community at the time. There was a institution, I'll say it like that, who was put it, who put out a call for submissions, and they had, like all submission calls have, they have criteria of what they'll accept and what they won't accept. This one was a organization that didn't want more adult themes and tending towards violence in uh, gro- not grotesque, but gratuitous uh, vulgarity and sex and things like that. But then they had a rider on that criteria and the, the rider, it wasn't even a rider. It was included in things like gore and violence and included in that was about LGBTQ fiction. Um, how, I was enraged, and I'm a straight white male. How did you react when you saw that? You know, honestly, in the year of our Lord 2018, which is when this happened, mostly my first thought was, wow, they're going to regret this. (laughs) Um, Because luckily, um, actually, the LGBTQ community is 
really quite welcomed in the writer community, at least in my part of the writer community. And, um, and so I was very happy to see that everyone, including people who aren't part of the community, was very, very outraged by that and just did not consider that acceptable. Mm-hmm. And that's very, actually very hopeful to see because even, you know, a decade or 15 years ago, um, that would have been a very common thing to see, if not explicitly, certainly tacitly. Mm-hmm. It, 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 the response was ab- absolutely amazing. Uh, I don't think mm-hmm. I've ever had that kind of uh, reaction on Twitter on my timeline with notifications. It was very empowering. Mm-hmm. It was it, it was kind of discouraging that you know anybody, allies or people personally affected or directly affected by that had to actually rally to that cause. So, um, like you said, I, th- I find uh, I found the reaction wonderful. I found the need for a reaction to be disappointing, unfortunately. What, um, it was, yes. Is it... for in, in this day and age, we still have to talk about these things. What is, mm-hmm. what is important for people, for readers to know about... Uh, not just the person, the LGBTQ writer, author, but about their fiction and about who they may be servicing with that fiction. What do we on the outside looking in kind of need to know maybe on a cognitive level or even on an emotional level about why it's so important to raise raise voices or, or come together when stuff like this happens? Well, I think the important thing to remember is just that if you're a straight person, you come from a culture that is constantly affirming you and you're just constantly seeing yourself and your relationships portrayed in a positive way in the world around you, Um, which is fine, but you have to remember that that's just not true for LGBTQ people. And so one of the reasons that it's so important to have inclusive literature is that this could be the only thing someone sees, especially I write for young people. And if I write a book with um, an LGBTQ character portrayed positively, that may be the first character of that type that this reader has ever seen. Mm -hmm. With your fiction, I want to talk about that in a second, if you don't mind about writing Mm -hmm. for a young audience versus uh, just genre of fiction, maybe adult fiction, not necessarily adult as an adult content, but for an adult audience. But before we get to that, kind of give us an idea, if you don't mind, what's that, what is the landscape like for LGBTQ writers it, in, in this day and age? And kind of help us understand what efforts go into establishing that platform or even that air of legitimacy. And is there the support inherently in the readership world for LGBTQ fiction and writers? Well, it's complex. I think the community of writers is very good and very supportive. And I found the community at large to just be very, very nice people and the readers for the most part too, but the overall ecosystem is much more complex. So it's, it's very, very well known that if you write a story with queer women in it, that's much harder to sell. And of course, publishers don't say, they don't say like this writing contest did, you know, no LGBTQ stories. Right. Um, But often you'll just find that you just won't hear back or they'll be more critical. The critical thing is very noticeable is that often you'll find criticisms that maybe are even fair criticisms, but just come up more often or are more adamant when it's an LGBTQ story. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen some uh, romances and rom-coms um, and they'll get criticized for things like, oh, the, you know, the plot was kind of contrived, you know, as if straight romances never had kind of contrived plots, you know, but suddenly right. this criticism will come to the fore when you're talking about a story with two girls. Right. Um, that kind of thing. Got- so it's rarely as blatant as it is um, with this wine writing contest, but um, it's still there, especially on the on the publishing side. And I, and that makes me wonder, and if you don't mind sharing, I'm absolutely curious about the experience and and what it feels like with, uh, gosh, how, I don't even know how to 
categorize them in a less than, I don't want to say antagonistic way. I don't want this to, to, I don't want to bias your response, but I am curious when you, you're talking about the, the reaction and, and some of the dynamics to the, or the complexity of the environment, if you will. I, I've seen it. I don't know how prevalent it is, but for an LGBTQ writer, when you see things from the pushback people, the, those are the people on Twitter who tell you the only reason you got the success you did is because you write gay characters and gay characters are all the rage. What I'm sure you have to probably self editorialize before you take back to a response, but like, I don't, I don't get people where that comes from too, but how does, how does a writer respond if they do, how do they respond to that type of comment back at them? It kind of strips away. I feel it strips away the legitimacy of what you do. And now you're not even talking about your work. You're talking about, you know, this issue or that person's issue with gay characters. Uh, but we're not able to celebrate your, your work in that kind of response. So I'm very curious for you as the creator, how do you handle stuff like that? Well, in the first place, of course, for centuries in literature, you, you couldn't publish these stories at all, or you could only publish them if you had a tragic ending, had something bad happen where the characters get their comeuppance at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, so even if we did have a cultural advantage right now, you'd think that would only be only be fair, honestly, um, but we really, really don't. Right. Um, of course, if you look at just books that come out today, new releases, the vast, vast majority of them have straight romances in them. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, you'll get maybe a few dozen um, queer books out of, out of hundreds of new releases in my uh, age category every year. Is that be is so? I guess that will lead me right into the question I wanted to ask earlier about the young market. Is there something unique to that to to writing YA fiction with LGBTQ characters? It, does it present unique challenges to you? And if there are writers listening to you right now who also want to write, whether we're talking about just general fiction or YA fiction with gay characters, what would be some of the unique th- challenges and maybe benefits to the market? And then what would they need to kind of think about, maybe prepare themselves for? You know, I think um, YA is actually one of the most inclusive segments of the market and LGBTQ literature is just doing very, very well in that sector compared to adult or other types of um, literature. And just, I think young people today have grown up for the most part in a very inclusive environment. They've grown up and they have people they know who are gay, who are married. They might have an uncle or an aunt or something. And they have classmates who are out openly and things like that. And of course, many of them are also LGBTQ themselves. And so I think that's just very natural to them to see that represented in stories. Um, whereas even people my age, you know, when I was in high school, gay was a, was a slur, it was an insult. Right, right. And things have changed very rapidly. So I think that's really nice to see that um, young people, especially readers, the young readers are really embracing of um, LGBTQ identities. Now that is great. That is even more of encouraging of an answer than I anticipated. So that is great to hear. And I, my follow-up question kind of really doesn't follow up so well now, but I think it's important, especially because many of the uh, listeners of this show are folks who are working very hard on their craft and may not even be published yet. And if they are, it's one or two works that they've got out there. So we're as a community, we're still very much newer writers so I think it's important for them to hear this. And, and if if you don't mind, I'd like to ask about your personal experience, but about any um, problems that you have faced because as a result of the fiction that you've published, and if there was any unique reader reaction that 
kind of like caught you by surprise or was something you had to hit the pause button and think about in how you were going to react to it? I actually have, have not had any um, reactions to my work or me specifically that have been very strongly negative based on um, LGBT content. Um, my first novel that came out does have a straight romance. It's the central romance. It has LGBT characters in it, but they're not the main characters. So that's part of it. But I've done other works that were... Um, and I was very worried at first. I remember um, I have this queer anthology I participated in that I was selling at my first event. And I remember my first event, um, it was there on the table, but I was just not quite sure. It was in a children's book fair and I was there with my YA books. And I was not quite sure, like, should I be plugging this? Are parents going to get mad at me? And mm -hmm. um, when I started talking to people about it, I was just amazed that it was just no big deal. I wasn't getting anyone saying like, Oh, what about the kids or anything like that? And after that, I've just been really completely confident. You know, and I think I'm glad you actually said that because that's I, listeners. I'm not talking to Gwen right now. I'm talking to you. Uh, especially if you identify like me, you're straight uh, because he, I want you to hear what she just said. She had to think about that. When we are sitting at a table with our books do we stop and think about, can I market this? Can I talk this kid up with the book that I have to offer? I can do that with one of my books because it's very adult themed and the horror is pretty grotesque. I know easily it's black and white for me. It's not for people under 18. I didn't write it for them. But for anything else I have, I don't even think about that. And I think that's something that we don't, ne we straight people don't necessarily stop and think about sometimes is, the fact that Gwen even has to do that, you know what I mean? I, I think that's a profound, you gave me a profound moment there, Gwen. And I really appreciate that because I think it's something that we need to, everybody has a different type of reaction to when somebody calls them privileged. And that's one of the ways that we can recognize how good we have it as straight people in America in 2019 now already, uh, that we don't even, even things like that, we don't have to stop and think about. And it, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm glad you had that kind of good reaction from it. That is, this is so encouraging of a conversation. Well, um, partly it's because I write YA, I write for teenagers. Um, if you write for a younger audience, things get much more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, when you write middle grade, there still is that think about the kids reaction. Okay. And you still will get school sometimes, parents sometimes saying that you shouldn't have this book and it's too mature you know, you shouldn't be exposing kids who are eight or nine or 10 to these kinds of themes and ideas and picture books even more so. See, now that's discouraging because if the picture book had mommy and daddy in the garage or in the backyard, it would be fine. But if it has mommy and mommy in the backyard in the same scene, that's something we shouldn't expose kids to. Right, right. And that's just kind of this idea that um, LGBTQ immediately means like sex, right? right? right. And it's mature. So um, of course, if you have mom and dad in a picture book, nobody thinks like, oh, this is too mature for kids because mom and dad are probably having sex, you know, not <laughs> right. on page, but, you know, in their life somewhere. Right. <laughs> um, but if you have, yeah, if you have mom and mom or dad and dad, then people will think that they'll think like, oh no, these kids will be thinking about sex because these two adults are probably doing it somewhere. <laughs> I I imagine for gay couples, it's just like straight couples. Everybody has sex. Shocker. <laughs> and then as you, the longer you go on, you have, you have your uh, um, ebb and flow of life that changes with it. It's, it's just so weird that we still have to have these conversations. But again, mm -hmm. this is why I was so... Uh, excited that you were open to, to coming on the show and talking about these things. As writers, this is important for us to hear. Love lost and love found. A boy and his dog. A motorcycle trip with a ghost. A girl and her dream. Strange things happening on the farm. Holiday tales and stories of yesteryear small town, big city, and everywhere in between. The joys of a tender friendship 
a moment in the sun, to the last sensations of a lingering kiss. Our lives are filled with stories, and it is those stories that we leave as our legacy. Coming spring 2019, from the Horrible Writing Writer Support Facebook group, is the Stories We Tell podcast, a pulsating production about our stories, the stories of us. Subscribe today on your favorite podcatcher. Find us on Twitter at TSWTPod. And join our Facebook community by searching for the official Stories We Tell podcast group. For more information, head over to paulsading.com forward slash the stories we tell. Just, just so everybody knows, this may be your first episode of the show, and you, you came along because you wanted to hear Gwen talk. That's great. Welcome. Glad to have you here. But the tagline of this show from episode one was empowerment through candor. I fully believe in writers not treating each other like competition and actually helping each other out, lifting each other with our efforts. So, Gwen, I ask you this, this next question in that spirit uh, of telling us what we kind of need to hear, as, especially as straight writers. How can we be better allies from a writer perspective? So not just Paul being Paul, but Paul, the author, and then kind of a follow up to that. How can not only how can we be better allies as straight writers, but what is one thing that you feel, if anything, one thing you feel as straight writers, I shouldn't ever do with gay characters? Okay, well, um, As I said earlier, I think, especially amongst writers in the writing community, I don't see bigotry that's overt very often. Mm -hmm. But I think it'll be an undertone in people's thoughts that they may not be realizing they have. So I want you to just think, especially when you're reading, maybe you're beta reading or you're just reading another author's book. And if you start having negative thoughts about their characters, their LGBTQ characters, Um, or the situations they're in or the things they do, I really want you to interrogate that. And that doesn't mean that you can't say negative things about an LGBTQ book in a review or something, but I really want you to think carefully about would you be making these same criticisms if the characters were straight? Or are you just um, kind of unconsciously or subconsciously bringing biases to the work that you may not even realize you have. Mm -hmm. And as for um, things that you should never have a gay character do, you know, I think I'm going to go back to the basics and just say, usually in most circumstances, you don't want to kill off your uh, gay character's love interest. The tragic gays thing, um, that is still something we see a lot. Not so much in books anymore, still sometimes, but a lot on TV shows and stuff where they'll they'll reveal like, oh, surprise, this character is gay and here they have a boyfriend. And then very next episode, oh, boyfriend ate it, you know, that kind of thing. And that's something that's still very common and, and very tiresome. Okay. No, and, and that's a great uh, characterization of it, tiresome. That's a powerful word. And, and that's good stuff. That's good stuff for us to hear now. Let's kind of flip this because there may be folks listening who think that advice is great, but but they themselves are an LGBTQ plus writer. And that's mm-hmm. whether or not that's their market, that's who they are. Now, let's talk to them, especially if, you know, if they are an emerging writer, they're new, maybe even a younger writer who's really wanting to kind of get some advice on the way ahead. What are some piece of pieces of advice that you would give to that broad? I know it's a pretty broad spectrum and I apologize for that, but that broad spectrum of writers who may be just starting out or maybe have been dabbling, but they themselves identify LGBTQ and they're getting into this. They've heard you say that the writing community is supportive, but what other pieces of advice would you give to them? Oh, it's tricky because the community is supportive, but it's, it's also challenging. So it's not a secret that like I sold my first book that had a straight romance in it. 
And the second book I wrote, which is also about women during World War II, but it has a lesbian romance in it. And that one I haven't been able to sell yet and has had a much, much harder time. So it is, it, it can be difficult. The market can be difficult. Um, but I really do want to be encouraging. I want writers to not self-reject. You know, I think a lot of writers will think that they may as well not even try subbing to publishers or agents because it's just not going to work and that, you know, they have no choice but to just self-publish or something, which can be the right route for a lot of people. But I want you to not assume that you wouldn't be able to get this out in the traditional market because um, the market is changing. It's changing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Do you, have you found or talked to other writers may, because maybe you don't have extensive experience yourself in it, but when it comes to, you know, traditional versus indie, indie publishing, have you found uh, that that you would maybe refer a new writer one way or another if they were just starting their journey? It's a hundred percent about you. They're just very different. Um, they're both completely legitimate career choices um, they just have different pros and cons. So self-publishing has a lot of virtues. You have complete artistic control over your work, and that can be very important for LGBTQ writers. Um, it is possible for a, um, agents and editors to want you to do things with your characters or with your work to make it sort of more palatable to a mainstream audience that as they see it, that you're not going to be okay with. And, um, uh, so self-publishing allows you to really um, write the story that's true for you and not, not worry about um, other influences who want you to turn it into something else. Um, but on the other hand, traditional publishing really lets you get it out there to a very broad audience. And a lot of audiences will consider it, you know, um, will find those books and read them that might not have found them if you self-published them. So um it's a hundred percent just what you think is the right option for you. That's no, that's great advice. That's excellent advice. One of the things that I'd love your uh, response on Gwen is I try to be very careful about the message that I send on the show because I don't know everybody who is on the other end of the earbuds for each episode, but I'm very much into empowerment, recognizing that I'm a straight white male in America. So I try to keep that in the forefront of my mind when I try to do empowerment because I'm I'm a huge cheerleader for everybody. But I also realize that I can defeat people sometimes with my rah-rah, go get them coming from me. One of the things I say on this show quite often is trying to encourage people to take your space. There's space for you out there. It is yours. You mm -hmm. like, You have to go take it. Coming from your perspective, though, if you were a new writer or or even just you yourself right now today, and you hear that message coming from someone like me, is how, what is that re possible type of reaction that you might have, and how could it be better framed for people in the LGBTQ community? Yeah, well... Um yeah, there can be different considerations going on there um, because a lot of a lot of LGBTQ writers, especially if they're writing something that's a little bit outside what the mainstream likes to see, um, they do just hit up against that wall, mm -hmm. and they can. It can happen that you can be as empowered as is humanly possible, and you can still sometimes not make it in the in the book world. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, I don't want to turn people off from that. It can be a difficult market, but I really want people to, to still go for it because, right. you know, I think that's the, um, the only way we actually get progress is if people are um, attempting to um, change the market and improve things. Right. But the, the particular thing is I do see a lot of LGBTQ authors switching to a, a, a more acceptable market segment. And a lot of them, a lot of them write straight romances because they find that that's easier to sell. 
or sometimes um, writers uh, who are who are lesbian, who are queer girls, prefer to write characters who are queer boys because those are much much easier to sell. Um, and if that's just your passion, if that's what you enjoy writing, you should certainly do that. But um, I see a lot of people who I think the story of their hearts is mm -hmm. stories about people like them, but they feel the need to write stories about people who are not like them because they think they'll sell better. And I really want to encourage those people to really try to write the story that's telling your story, if that's what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's beautiful. That's uh, that's excellent. And, and anything I can do to help that writer who just heard Gwen say that, please reach out to me so I can help give you a platform for that. Now, Gwen, at this point, I'm going to be a good host, like I always am, to my guests. And I'm going to ask for your horrible writing experience. Now, listeners, if this is your first episode, you may have no idea why I'm asking Gwen to talk up something like a horrible writing experience. But give me a chance. I believe wholeheartedly if people like Gwen come onto the show and they share their horrible writing experience, whatever it may be, I have no idea what she's about to say. Um, but if they can share an experience that they've gone through and they've come out the other side of accomplishing what Gwen has accomplished, it's a clear message that shows us that we can do that too. So in that spirit, Gwen, what is your horrible writing experience? You know, I think my best one I have to share is that I sent my first story for publication uh, when I was 12. Wow, that is awesome. <laughs> and I had written this picture book, you know, and I was just absolutely sure, like, this is going to get published. And I was sending it out to publishers, and this was back when you had to actually print it out and put it in an envelope and mail it to the publisher and... Uh, I got back a lot of rejections, of course, and nowadays I, I, I kind of cringe thinking, oh, those poor editorial assistants who got this, this story written by a 12-year-old. And I'm sure they were just looking at it going like, this was definitely written by a small child. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I will say they were all very polite in rejecting me. That but, is awesome. <laughs> And I, I, I hope none of them are still working today. And I hope none of them are seeing me now being like, is that the person who wrote that picture book when she was like 12, you know? Who knows? They might think it's neat that you hung around and you didn't go, I don't know, take up some other career path like accounting or something. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Hopefully, hopefully, if they did happen to remember me, they would appreciate that I've, I've grown as a writer in the past 20 years. <laughs> and that's the thing. And it's funny you say that because I was going to take away my lesson learned from your your experience as, you know, uh, m measuring that growth. I think we, yours is a pretty extreme example, looking back at yourself as a 12 year old, obviously. But I think as as writers, it's important for us to never, ever, ever lose sight of the fact that we're going to hopefully always grow if we keep working on our craft and to not get stuck in that death cycle of editing that first manuscript uh, for years and years. I mean, I know, and I'm sure you do too, Gwen, know writers who have a wonderful book that they've been editing for years and upon years, and they're just not going to ever release it to the world. Uh, I like it as a measuring stick. You look back at the mm -hmm. earlier stuff and you go, yeah, but people still enjoy it. You're out there and you're moving forward and, and growing as a writer. So I think that's a great lesson to take away from that. And I love that you just did it. You know, when I say, I asked you the question about take your space and what you just shared is an example. I mean, that's manifest manifesting the, the take your space mentality. You were 12 and you were like, screw it. You're going to get this published in your in your magazine or as a children's book because I'm that awesome and you didn't stop mm -hmm. that is so so awesome so yeah well um the positive side of that experience was I was being treated by these publishers like an adult you know they were reading my story and they were rejecting it but they were rejecting it on even footing with other stuff um, they weren't treating me like a kid, you know, like, right. oh, that's nice. That's nice, little Susie, your little story you wrote. Um, and I had an adult friend who was a writer who, who who I showed my book to. And I remember her being the one who looked at this manuscript and actually went, oh, no, this isn't publishable. And the reason why is 
there's this problem here. It's, it shifts point of view, you know, it head hops. And um, so that's why this story, you're not going to be able to publish it. And that actually being a, a very positive experience for me is having someone look at my work like an adult and evaluate it as in terms of whether it's actually publishable quality. And they said it wasn't because of course it wasn't, but um, that helped me grow as a writer. And that helped me feel like I was being treated like a real writer and not just like a kid who has a, a silly hobby. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no, no. Thank you for that. And thank you for saying that portion of it. And now that uh, everyone's had a chance to really, really benefit from your experience and your perspective on things, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing that stuff, but I do want to give you a chance to talk about some of the stuff that you've got out there so that now listeners who've heard you kind of fall in love with you, they want to go check out what you've actually done. Where would you point them at? Do you want to talk about some of your work that you've got out there and maybe give us a little hint of what's to come? Mm-hmm. Well, um, my novel is Among the Red Stars, and it's the story of Russia's famous all-female bomber regiment, the Night Witches. And that came out in 2017. And um, another book I thought your uh, listeners might be interested in is I'm in this new anthology, putting the science in fiction, um, put it, put together by Dan Cobalt. And that's one where experts in different fields come together and share um, tips for writers on how to make their book more realistic in terms of science and um, how things work, especially in, science fiction and fantasy. Awesome. I will, uh, I'll make sure I put that out there for folks. Now you are still, uh, looking to put some other stuff out there. You're right. You're, you're trying to get a second book on the market. Are you doing anything in the independent space? Not right now. Okay. So it, it may not be, I may not have anything coming out in the, in the very near future. Okay. If you ever do, you you make sure I know so I can put that in there. But listeners, uh, as far as Among the Red Stars and putting the science and fiction, I'm going to also link those in the show notes. So you don't have to go anywhere to go find them. Just scroll down uh, on your player and you'll have those things hyperlinked so you can go directly to them. Uh, Gwen, I do want to thank you for your time and coming on and talking about this Um uh, again, I want to reframe it to the positive progressive. It was an ugly incident that brought us together, but it also just resulted in you know thousands of people being able to hear a message about how we can reframe it and how we can support each other and our LGBTQ friends in, in the space. So I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Where can folks find you on the internet? Where would you like to, them to find you? I think I'm most active on Twitter and my handle is at Gwen C. Katz. So you can always find me there or you can always look me up on my website, GwenCKatz.com. All right. I will put those in the show notes as well. Again, Gwen, I thank you for your time. And listeners, keep being epic. This has been Horrible Writing, and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. I am Paul Sadin, your host, Extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse at Writing Horrible and over at paulsadin.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less. <laughs> <laughs>